Welcome to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV, still the voice of the voiceless. Comment is the big conversation, the great debate, but it can only be either of those if you join in. That's why, above all, I need your telephone calls. The number to ring is 44208-601-4555. You call us, we'll call you back. Establish a clear line. And remember, if you got on the television with me, the volume on your television has to be down at zero. Or I'll have to move on because no one will understand either of us. You can also SMS the show and it comes up there on the comment wall, 4478 00008066. Or you can email me at comment at prestv.co.uk. And this being the 21st century, you can tweet me at comment underscore press TV. Two subjects tonight, both of them of great moment and both of them inextricably linked. The first is the decision yesterday of the Saudi Arabian court to order the execution of Sheikh al nimr the leader of the Shiite minority in Saudi Arabia, for no crime at all, for organizing peaceful, democratic demonstrations to demand rights for all the people of what they call Saudi Arabia. It's called democracy protesting, and in some parts of the world it would automatically attract vast sums of United States money and political and media support throughout the Western world. I'm thinking of Ukraine, for example, or Syria, for that matter. But in Saudi Arabia, it's covered up, and its organizer is sentenced to death by beheading, don't you know? You know the beheadings that so horrify Western journalists and Western political uh, leaders when they happen just across the border in Iraq at the hands of those whose ideology is very close to the ideology of the ruling Saudi regime, namely ISIS. So I'm asking tonight, what would Sheikh al nimrs execution represent? Well, Iran has appealed for the life of Sheikh al nimr demanded that the Saudi authorities halt this execution by beheading, and if they are denied that, the execution were to go ahead, the first and obvious consequence would be an extreme sharpening of the confrontation, contradictions between these two regional powers, Saudi Arabia and Iran. The second thing that would undoubtedly happen is that there would be a big reaction amongst the Shiite minority in the east mainly of Saudi Arabia and indeed amongst Shiites all over the world. And the third thing that would happen is that it would cause further damaging division between Muslims in the Middle East and beyond. That could only benefit those who have no time for Muslims of any kind, who don't know anything about the distinctions between Muslims, but are very happy to see Muslims fighting and preferably killing each other and preferably still buying weapons from Western countries with which to murder each other. So I believe the consequences of the execution of Sheikh al nimr would be exceedingly grave, would make every matter worse, and heaven knows we have enough trouble in the Muslim world already. And the second subject is, as I said, closely linked, because the Syrian Kurdish city that the Kurds call Kobani and the Arabs call Ain al-Arab is besieged by the fanatic savages of ISIL who like to behead just as much as the Saudi justice system does. And my goodness, they have been beheading in Kobani. At the height of the offensive, ISIL controlled something like 30% of the city and they laid it waste. They beheaded hundreds of people, many of them women, and posed for pictures holding up the heads of women. These also holy warriors of ISIL were also responsible for mass 
gang rape of female inhabitants of the city of Kobani. I wonder uh, how they square that with their professed Islamist fanatic Puritanism. Some Puritans, I must say, they have beheaded old people. There was one story that particularly has etched itself into my mind. An 80-year-old, 8-0, 80-year-old grandfather had his head cut off in front of his children and his grandchildren. For what reason? It's very, very difficult to fathom, except to create a state of terror. Now, that has worked elsewhere. It worked in Mosul, for example. It worked in other parts of western Iraq. Although there are reports today of tribes in the west of Iraq beginning to rise up against ISIL, and I hope those reports are true. Uh, but uh, in Kobani, it hasn't worked. The YPG, the youth section of the uh, Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, have fought as heroes, written their name into the history books. They're mainly young, they're mainly leftist, and many of the fighters are women. And they have fought street by street, house to house, with ISIL. And just in the last hour or two, there are reports that the military situation has begun to turn and that from 30%, ISIL are now back down to controlling some 15%. So it may be that Kobani will turn out to be a turning point, will turn out to coincide with a turning point uh, over the border in Iraq. But... Of course, there's still a very real danger that somehow ISIL will manage to conquer the city. Now, Kobani is very important strategically. If ISIL take control of Kobani, they will control almost the entirety of the Syrian-Turkish border. The Turkish regime of Erdogan has been building up these fanatic groups inside Syria for more than three years. Almost all of the money, almost all of the weapons, and almost all of the tens of thousands of foreign fighters, 500 of them, it's said, from Britain, thousands of them from Europe, but from all over the world they have come. And they've almost all passed without let or hindrance from Erdogan's regime across the Turkish border. ISIL would control that border almost in its entirety if Kobani were to fall. And the Turkish regime uh, is under grave pressure now from all sorts of people, from public opinion in the West that was told that Turkey was one of us, a member of NATO, a fraternal country, a putative member of the European Union, no less. And yet, it's abundantly clear that the government of Turkey is not prepared to lift a finger against ISIL, having made them and organizations like them strong in the first place. In fact, Turkey's substantial 20% Kurdish minority wants to cross the border to fight alongside the YPG guerrillas in Kobani. The Turkish regime is gunning them down. 30 of them have been killed. There's a huge Turkish military formation at the fence. Through the fence, just a few hundred yards away, are ISIL cutting people's heads off. The Turkish armed forces have not been permitted to raise a finger to stop this murder and mayhem by ISIL. Not only that, they've not been permitting Kurdish people who have gathered in substantial numbers at the border to try to get to the aid of their compatriots, their fellow Kurds, and have been stopped by the Turkish uh, uh, regime. So who would you blame if Kobani were to fall to ISIL? Turkey is number one on my list, 
but the other regimes in the Persian Gulf, Arab regimes in the Persian Gulf, have to take a huge slice of the responsibility, even though they are now, no doubt, rather afraid of what this ISIL phenomenon could become. And they know that Western public opinion, on which they depend, because without Western governments supporting them, these regimes would undoubtedly fall. They know they're in trouble with the ISIL phenomenon, but they also know that their fingerprints are on this Frankenstein monster that has been created in the region. Let's take the first call then on these two subjects. It's from Iran, from Javad. Javad, welcome to the show. Hi, George. How are you? By it's the grace of God, good, I'm good. It's an honor to talk to you live. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Regarding the so-called death penalty for Ayatollah Sheikh Nemer, yes. I wanted to say that uh, even if the Saudi, Saudis proceed or do that, it will be just a beginning for the Shias who have been marginalized in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. So it, even if it happens, Sheikh Nemer will be easily replaced by other brave Shia clerics. After the so-called Arab Spring or Islamic Awakening, some say, um, all Muslims want to make their own decisions. And I think in this act, I mean the death penalty for Sheikh Namer, is a shame for Saudi King, uh, King Abdullah, Saudi King, and other princes. Of course, it is not very astonishing, it's not very amazing, because it is expected from so-called Wahhabism or Salafist groups. And regarding your second, second, your second question, I think I, uh, the Saudis and also Americans are double standard, because they say we do not um, support ISIL or, I, or, or ISIS or IS, some say, but based on statistics, 70% uh, of suicide bombers are trained and supported financially or fiscally by King Abdullah and Saudi. So uh, at the same time, uh, I want to, I, I am, I mean, I am deeply sorry for Americans because um, they, I mean, the Americans trained Osama bin Laden against Soviet Union as a jihadist. And then Osama returned them in favor. Now they are creating buffer zone for ISIL or ISIS. So I am sure this supporting um, will return to them in favor. I mean, very soon we will see that ISIL will do something Osama bin Laden did in September the 11th. So I think both countries want to... Um, actually impose their own view on Muslim world, but they will not be successful for that. Um, okay, look, Javed, I that. need to press on. Uh, an excellent call. I just need to respond to a couple of things. You're right about the dangers of another 9-11. In fact, there have been many arrests in Britain and many plots, we're told, uh, that have been intercepted for a spectacular probably not on the level of 9-11, but a spectacular enough uh, crime involving uh, murder and maiming of significant individuals or large numbers of individuals. So you're right about that. I just need to make this point. Not all Salafists are Wahhabists, and not all Wahhabists are ISIS or ISIL. Uh, there are many decent Sunni Muslims who would regard themselves as Salafists, who would regard themselves as Wahhabis, who are not uh, the enemy of other Muslims. They may have a particular perspective on Islam that many will find unattractive. I do myself. Uh, but it's a legitimate trend. Both are legitimate trends. Where they become illegitimate is where they mutate into sectarian hatred and violence, murder and maiming and terrorism. And that's exactly what happened with bin Laden. Uh, and you're right, it was the United States and Great Britain 
principally using the money from Arab regimes in the Persian Gulf uh, who built that monster. And look what happened as a result. Thanks, Javed, in Iran. Let's go to Leicester, talk to Shabir on the same subject. Shabir, welcome. Thank you. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Go ahead. Um, I just want to mention that um, this um, farcical entity similar to Israel that calls itself by the name of its royal family, this so-called Saudi Arabia, mm. really needs to pay a lot of attention to what's happened historically. They should talk to their friends in Israel and actually learn something, perhaps. Because when Israel went and attacked um, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Sheikh Rahul al Harb, and then said Abbas al Musawi, all it did is make the resistance way stronger. So if these takfiris in, who occupy Arabia are going to go and essentially assassinate using law, or whatever they, what passes for the law over there, um, Sheikh Nimr, then they're just they're further signing their death warrant. So yes. I, I suspect that you're uh, you're right about that. Um, uh, the King, it was said in the previous caller that the king of Saudi Arabia uh, was responsible for funding ISIS. I should have said that I, I don't agree with that. But the Saudi regime has undoubtedly turned a blind eye to private funding of these, uh, these Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, type organizations. There's no doubt about that at all. Moreover, the official Saudi regime has poured huge sums of money and weapons into the so-called Syrian opposition and that money and certainly those weapons were promptly taken off the people who were given them by Al-Qaeda which has now spawned several uh, different uh, grouplets including uh, what we call uh, ISIL. But I agree with you entirely that uh, executing Sheikh Al-Nimr uh, will not uh, be a solution to the problems of Arabia, it will merely multiply those problems. Uh, but uh, dictatorships of all kind find it difficult to learn lessons, Shabir, don't you think? Unfortunately, this is the case. And uh, I've, I mean, history tells us that a dictatorship, when it feels threatened, which is most of the time, to be fair, because the whole regime is based on a very weak platform, yeah. generally tend to, even if someone looks at them the wrong way, they tend to go crazy and carry out psychotic activities against them. I mean, all Sheikh Dilmar was saying and has been saying is that we want equal rights for all of the people of uh, Arabia, yeah. not just this tiny ruling clique of takfiris yeah. who are essentially sharing this extreme ideology with the people who are carrying out carnage in Syria and Iraq. I, 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 can I just uh, engage you on that, uh, sure. Shabir? I, I don't believe that this tiny regime in Arabia are takfiris or Salafists or Wahhabists. I, 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 they are hypocrites. If you saw them in London when they get off the airplane, the men and the women, you, and you saw the kind of lives that they lead in London when they are here, or in Beirut for that matter, you would realize that the last thing in the world they are, are genuine uh, Wahhabis. They are here in London to gamble and to commit every sin uh, known to man and some we didn't even know about. Uh, they gamble, they, they do every bad thing uh, when they are here. So it's when they're there they pretend to be. I believe they're riding the tiger of Islamic extremism. They're not themselves extreme Islamists. What do you say? You're right. They, they're not, one could argue they are not even within any religion. Neither Islam on one side, no religion, no moral system mm. accepts people who behave in this way. Because like you say, they're hypocrites. With one face they say one thing, we are the custodians of the two holy places, yeah. and we organize the Hajj, but we destroy all of the monuments and special places and historical artifacts all over Mecca, Medina, and the rest of um, occupied Arabia. And on the other hand, just exactly as you said very rightly, when they come to Europe, when they come to other parts of the world, they act like the worst playboys. In fact, there are, there's evidence of them, of their Bahraini buddies, of their, uh, this one, Emirati buddies, all of these people behaving in a way that mm. is 
just despicable. I don't have the right word for it, and I couldn't mm. say it on the air even if I did. Mm. But the, these people are almost a stain, a blot upon humanity, like the Zionists who occupy. But they're, they're peas in the same pot. They're exactly the same. Just two sides of the same coin, like others say. And indeed, in some places, they work closely with each, with, with much each so. other. The, the, the guy, I forget his name, the prince, uh, the son of Talal, uh, who owns uh, a good slice of Fox News, owns a good slice of Sky News, owns uh, the Disneyland and so on. Uh, this man is as far away from uh, a pious Muslim as it's possible to be, but he's an honored member of the inner circle uh, of this regime, whilst being in alliance with Rupert Murdoch, one of the world's leading Zionists. He owns TV stations with Rupert Murdoch. And, and, and we're supposed to believe that he is a, a Wahhabi. Abdul Wahhab would, would be off with his head in five minutes. Shabir, thanks. A really good call. I really enjoyed talking to you. Hassan is in London on the same subject. Hassan, welcome. Thank you very much, George. Hi there. Um, literally, I've got my comment and is really simple. Double standard. Uh, you just mentioned about double standard being in the Saudi royal family. I'm talking about the double standard in literally in Britain right now, because um, we're talking about freedom of speech, uh, religious, um, accepting religious minorities, blah, blah. And then yet we have a really good close ally with Saudi Arabia just because of the military deals and all the oil deals that we have, which is nonsense. And when you look at the, and they're not appreciating in Saudi Arabia, they're not respecting any of the religious minority and the minority like this, for instance, the Shia minority over there is around 20% something of the whole population. And they say, okay, in the Hajj season, uh, everyone's allowed to practice their own sort of face of Islam. But when you see it actually from the, when you go inside the airport or in, the, in Medina or Mecca, they're just preaching the Wahhabi ideology and the Salafi ideology. And if you, uh, if you want to, uh, you can't even have like books, uh, holy books or books of supplication in the, for like Shia books, for instance. And then at the end of the day, when you look at it, the whole ISIS and the whole ideology of the ISIS has been sponsored and has been sort of funded uh, from Saudi Arabia, from Abdul Wahab. Um, and it just literally it shows as well, a few years back, Saudi was the biggest supporter helping the FSA and the ISIS in Syria. Mm. And even Britain was helping them, Turkey was helping them. And now they're saying, oh, we need to have a military intervention over there in Saudi Arabia, in, uh, sorry, in, um, against ISIS, which is nonsense. And they're just bombing Iraqi military uh, or even bombing uh, Syrian infrastructure. And yet, at the end of the day, this is a point, at the end of the day, when you see with, in Britain, they're the still close allies with Saudi Arabia. And on the opposition side, which is like, for instance, the minority, religious minority of Shias in Saudi Arabia or in Yemen, they're having a peaceful protest and they're being cracked down and knocked out by the Saudi uh, support and uh, money. And that goes both in Yemen and Bahrain, which is Literally, the, the question here is why we're still having a relationship with Saudi Arabia as a British uh, com, uh, country. And it's literally, it's just this relationship is just covered in blood and soaked in blood. That's it. Yeah. Uh, the, only, the only point, again, I need to engage you on is don't blame the Sunnis for that. The Sunnis are oppressed by these regimes as well as the religious minorities are oppressed. And we need to make common cause between uh, Muslims of all kinds uh, who are oppressed by tiny elites of hypocrites who are neither one thing nor the other. They are absolute hypocrites. They speak the language, no doubt, of the fanatics, but their playboy lives I don't know what, how they live there. I certainly know how they live here. Now, I need to take a very short break, just for three minutes, for a short news bulletin. We're talking about ISIL, and we're talking about Saudi Arabia and the imminent, perhaps imminent, execution of the leader of the Shiite minority in Saudi Arabia. Two very big questions and inextricably linked. So, in three minutes, God willing, I'll still be here. I hope you will be. Don't go away.
Welcome back to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV. Still the voice of the voiceless. We're debating tonight the subject of Kobani, the Syrian Kurdish city under siege, indeed partly invaded by ISIL, asking the question, if Kobani falls to ISIL, who would be to blame? And we're talking about the declared uh, intention to execute by beheading ISIS style of the Sheikh al nimr the leader of the Shiite minority community in Saudi Arabia. Iran has uh, called on the Saudi government to halt the uh, planned execution. Uh, there's a huge campaign developing here in London. There are demonstrations outside the Saudi embassy. There's a hashtag, Free Sheikh Nimr. There are all sorts of agitation going on now, uh, even before a date for the execution has been announced. And I'm arguing that if this execution were to proceed, there's going to be an awful lot of trouble, not just in the region, but around the world. Mo in the UK wants to talk about Kobani and ISIL. Mo, welcome to the show. Hi, George. Hi, go ahead, sir. Uh, George, we have to we have to clear one uh, issue that's misleading. Yeah. Um, the IS, uh, this so these murderers, uh, band of uh, murderers, they did not capture any equipment. They were already issued with this equipment. They were trained by the Americans and the British in uh, Jordan and Turkey before they even arrived into Syria, and uh, they already had this equipment. Uh, issue to them. They only became the IS after they crossed uh, out of Syria into Iraq and they threatened uh, the uh, oil fields, uh, you know, the uh, national interest. But the other point is the reason that uh, the U.S. and the U.K. need to distance themselves from these guys and, and make allegations that they captured the, the, uh, the equipment, uh, you know, like Humvees and uh, AR-15 rifles and uh, what have you, is because of the beheadings of these journalists and uh, humanitarian workers. Because once the British and American publics discover that these horrible monsters were trained by the Americans and British in camps in Jordan and Turkey, and they have and they were issued this equipment, then they will be in trouble. The, the governments in the UK and Washington DC will be in trouble. So they're trying to distance themselves. Uh, from from these guys, but they they did not capture the equipment. They were issued this equipment, and that's the point. But also the uh, Saudi monarchy, some of the uh, members of the monarchy, not all of them, granted, but some of them are financing the Wahhabist movement. Oh, the, there's no doubt that they're financing the Wahhabist movement, but not every Wahhabist is in ISIS or supporter of uh, Al Qaeda. That's the distinction I was trying to make. I don't actually agree with you, uh, Mo, and you made one, uh, but that's a matter of opinion, but you made one factual uh, error. Uh, they were Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Under Zarqawi, uh, they committed uh, acts of such atrocity against the local population that the local population rose up and drove them into Syria. Then they were part of Al-Qaeda, in the Levant. Then they split from Al-Qaeda. Indeed, Zawahiri expelled them uh, because they were too sectarian, too violent, too extreme, even for Al-Qaeda. And then they made this extraordinary military advance in Iraq. It's from Iraq they got the Humvees. They weren't given Humvees in Syria. They took them from uh, the, uh, the uh, Iraqi military, and they took much of their heavy equipment from the Iraqi military. But on, I, I'm with you in this, to this extent. When these foolish regimes in the Persian Gulf and the British, French, and the United States were pouring in lethal and non-lethal military aid, pouring in hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, they didn't really much care in whose hands it ended up. They didn't train ISIL in Jordan. ISIL comes from 
the north from across the Turkish frontier. They are trying to build up a southern front, but it hasn't happened yet, and the Jordanian regime are very anxious about going that final step. Uh, the reality is that the Free Syrian Army is a fictional army. And so if you give it guns and money, someone is going to take the guns and money off them. And that is precisely what happened. About one year ago, all of the military warehouses of the so-called FSA were simply attacked and robbed of every last bullet and every last piece of weaponry within them. That was entirely predictable and predicted by me before it happened. I'm getting tired being right, Mo, especially on matters of such import. Thanks for your call. Alexander is in London, wants to talk about the same subject, Kobani. Alexander, welcome. Um, hello, Mr. Galloway. Um, I just want to say about Kobani is um, that it obviously will be the, the British and the American will be blamed, and the Turkish. So and they're playing on both sides. Both sides of the of the border, and which is which is not nice, it's not fair. And about the sheikh that, that the Saudi are about to execute, uh, which is uh, I'm saddened about that. I'm a Sunni Muslim, but as long as the I mean I regard the Shia Muslims as Muslims. It doesn't matter how they um, practice, as long as they, they know the the the, the Ashhada and the fasting, and they eat Salah. Anything from that, they're Muslims. And to come back to Kobani, if it falls, it obviously will be the, the Turkish to be blamed. They wanted this to happen. And um, obviously that's, that, that's how it's They did, be. Uh, Alexander, and I mean to all you said before it, uh, they did want this to happen, but they put all their eggs in the basket of the fall of the Syrian regime. Uh, Davutoglu, the foreign minister of Erdogan, said repeatedly over and over and over again that the Syrian regime would fall in weeks, in weeks, in weeks. For three and a half years, he was claiming that it was going to fall in weeks. I told Davutoglu that not only was this not true, but that the Syrian regime would never fall. I, I put it this way. The Syrian regime is too strong to fall and too weak to control all of its former territory. So you are entering into something which can only end in impasse. And that's what we have now, impasse. And I predicted it almost three and a half years ago when Davutoglu was predicting the regime would fall within weeks. And Turkey has now got itself into a catastrophic situation. It, it, it now has an enemy in Syria, it has an enemy in Iraq, it has an enemy in Iran, it has an enemy in Russia, it has an enemy in China, and its friends are not dependable because they tolerated Erdogan, but they don't really like him. And he's now making an enemy of the very Kurdish people uh, who he had engaged in the peace process with. And we could be in the situation where war with the Kurdish minority in Turkey begins to blaze at the same time as both neighboring countries, Iraq and Syria, are on fire. How can Erdogan imagine that he will not be burned in those fires? Alexander, thanks for the call. Patrick is in Doncaster. Go ahead, Patrick. Good evening, George. Salamakam. Walaikum salam. Go ahead. Mr. Blair and Mr. Bush uh, to blame for these issues in yeah. Iraq. Yeah. They've Good. turned up the uh, they've turned the Middle East upside down and shaking it like a piggy bank, and then they're stood around on the BBC, scratching their heads, wondering what are we going to do, other than pouring in more troops and expunging uh, ex or taking out more blood of innocent men, women and children. And the general consensus 
in the West, I find, where I live in Doncaster, is it's OK to bomb Iraq. It, it's OK. I mean, we've bombed it for the past 100 years. Well, that's right. I was just about to say that, Patrick. Why we have been continue? bombing it for a very long time. Exactly, brother. We, so drop, we dropped the first ever chemical weapons drop from an aeroplane on the Kurdish people in Iraq in the 1920s. Exactly. So we need to reach a, a place in our society where we hold Blair and Bush to account for what they've done in the Middle East. Not I'm working Iraq, on that, Patrick. You know I'm making this movie, The Killing of Tony Blair, coming your you? way. I hope it plays in the... Doncaster uh, Odeon. And uh, that's something that I've uh, donated to, uh, actually, George. Excellent. Thanks, Patrick. No problem. God bless. Thank you. God Good bless night. you. Thanks for that call. Patrick in Doncaster on the subject of Kobani. Now, in the last hours, uh, as I brought to you, uh, my information is that the YPG, the heroic, mainly young, often female fighters of the YPG, the youth section of the PKK are pushing back the ISIL fanatics who have invaded their city, murdering and mutilating as they went, and raping, by the way. How's that for, uh, for uh, fanatic Islamism? Raping women, cutting the heads of women. Couldn't make this up. Now, our youngest and cleverest correspondent, in Peterhead, Robert. Go ahead, Robert. Good evening, George. Nice to talk to you again. Go ahead. Yeah, it is. It's been a while since I've called in, and it lots is. of things have changed in that time period. One of which is that I am now 15 years of age. Wow. From the mouths of babes. But when you were only 14, you were like a professor. So goodness knows what you'll be like now that you're 15. Go on. Now, when it comes to the so-called Islamic State, Above all, Erdogan is the person to blame. He allowed them to set up near the Turkish border and allowed weapons to be sent across the border, and now he's refusing to help the people of Kobani simply because it is the Kurds that have the backbone to fight these fanatics, these liars that call themselves Muslims. Erdogan needs to swallow his pride and work with the Kurds, or the Kurdish civilians of Kobani are going to be butchered in the streets. Either Erdogan acts now and helps the people of Kobani and of Syria, or the black banner of these fanatics of hatred and of murder will fly over Kobani, and Turkey will be attacked, make no mistake, and Erdogan will go down in history as the man that failed to protect his citizens, allowed the river of blood to flow, and allowed Kobani to go down in flames, all because he could not see the bigger picture and could only see helping the so-called enemies of the state, the Kurdish people and the YPG who have the backbone to fight these murderers. Hallelujah, Robert. Uh, there's nothing I can say to that perfectly expressed, perfectly analysed, and uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you're still staying the course. You're a credit to your parents and to your school. Well done, Robert, in Peterhead. H hitting the nail on the head, isn't he? If Kobani falls to ISIL, if the black flag of these murderers and liars and hypocrites were to fly over Kobani, the blame would be shared. It's true. Bush and Blair, the, uh, the uh, different regimes in the region that have helped build them up. Uh, but Erdogan in Turkey must have to take most of the blame. Tanto is in Turkey. I want to talk about Sheikh al namars execution. Go ahead, my friend. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. George. Welcome, sir. Go ahead. Okay, I will first of all appreciate you for what you have been doing for the international community, like exposing the evils that is happening in the world. You have been doing a marvelous job, and I appreciate you. Thank you. You are inspiring both of us here out there. We admire you so much. Then Thank you. I will like say the brutal regime in Saudi Arabia. You see, the Americans, the Western powers, they still cooperate with that regime. I don't know. It's really a double standard in the world. So it's like, it's complicated. The regime that they, they don't respect human rights, human issues, they, they still collaborate, the Western, the Western powers, they still collaborate with such regime. So the world is a little bit something else. Tanto, it's not a great line, but it's a great line that you're expressing, I'm sure, 
but I just couldn't grasp enough of it. My apologies, dear brother. Try again next week. Ali's in Norwich on the same subject, though. Ali, welcome. Hello, Mr. Galloway. Um, hereditary monarchy is inherently un-Islamic. Now, Ibn Saud came to power in the, in the holy lands of Najd and Hijaz in 1932, and his sons have been in power since. Now, all commentators are unanimous that the Saudi regime will fall, and it's just a matter of time. Saudi Arabia is paranoid about dissent. The Muslim cleric, now I emphasize the Muslim cleric, Sheikh Al-Namir, is the straw that may break the camel's back. ISIL is a safety valve, and previous to that Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, and serves to get rid of dissent, identify and export dissent from primarily Saudi Arabia, and then the other Arab states. Now, the Muslim youth are frustrated and want to stand up for their faith and to, and to various enemies. However, the Quran says, if I may just say a quick quote, chapter 5, verse 51, Ya ayyuhal ladina amalu la tattakhidu yahudu wa nasara ulya. O you who believe, don't take the Jews and Christians, sorry, we're talking about the regimes, not the people, don't take the Jews and the Christians as patrons and allies. Unfortunately, ISIL um, was formed by Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Qatar with the active blessing of U.S. and U.K. Hence, ISIL's lack of hostility to Israel during the Gaza genocide and the aversion to Kurds, i.e. the enemies of Turkey. Now, wh why have U.S., Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan ganged up against Assad in Syria? I mean, we don't love Assad but he is the most anti-Israeli Arab, Arab leader and part of the axis of resistance. There is more eligible candidates to get rid of, like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan, etc. Now, finally, to Muslim youth the world over, the answer is pure Islam and to unite. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Uh, very powerfully expressed. Unfortunately, the phone got a bit funny towards the end, but thanks very much for the call. Uh, Eric is calling all the way from Thailand. Let's hear from him. Eric, welcome. Thank you. Hello, George. Hello, sir. Nice to hear from you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm op uh, originally coming from Norway, but I'm staying in Thailand. Okay. And I would uh, see this uh, Kobani thing on uh, the news. Uh, fortunately, I can see you on TV. I don't need to use internet. Well, and I'm grateful for that, for good old Kobani. Thailand. Soon, soon uh, we'll be back uh, on TV everywhere, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, especially America and England, with France and Saudi Arabia, and especially Turkey, is to blame if uh, Kobani falls. And just now, I feel ashamed to be a Norwegian and be a Scandinavian. The NATO has had a Scandinavian chief for uh, the last four years from Denmark. Now, the Norwegian former prime, prime minister is the boss of NATO. And Turkey is a member of NATO and they sit on the fence and do nothing. Well, that's right, Eric. Uh, uh, and of course, this uh, Norwegian uh, goes around the world threatening people with other people's armies. Uh, that's what Mussolini used to do, go around threatening people with somebody else's army. He has been one of the most belligerent, aggressive, warlike uh, uh, heads of NATO that we have ever had. NATO is inherently of course, a military alliance, an offensive military alliance, which is stretching its area of operation ever outwards. Eric, thanks for that call. In Thailand, let's go to Spain. Might be the last call. Stephen in Spain. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. Go on, sir. Turn your television down. Yeah. Um I'm so telling you, thank you for the, this your program when you on. Thank you. I saw because you are, you are doing a lot of good job. Thanks. 
Because the only things when I'm seeing Kobani when it's going up, up on right now, you know, when somebody creates something, he has to, to fight against them back. Because the only things when I want to say to the, the, the owner organizes type of group, they have to, and then I never know if they are trying to shame in the world what they are done. Because if they don't shame in the world, they will be able to find idea how to tackle this ISIS. Stephen, you've got your television up, so I'm going to need to press on. I have to make good uh, sometimes what I say at the beginning, uh, which is a great pity because uh, your call was interesting. But if you're listening to yourself uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, d the time delay, uh, we can hear the time delay coming through the phone and it spoils it for everybody. So please, everyone, take note. If you get on the television with me, your own television has to be down at zero. Or nobody will be able to understand your call. We have had, though, a tremendous discussion about Kobani. Kobani is one of the turning points in this great battle against these Takfiri savages. I said that I had heard today from a reputable source both that the YPG militia were on the advance inside the city and that ISIL were falling back. Moreover, that the YPG were taking countryside outside and alongside the city for the first time in many weeks. The people have been terrified everywhere by the advance of these savage beheaders. But the young fighters in Kobani stood tall, stood strong, and may well now be prevailing. But the overarching story is Saudi Arabia. As was pointed out, kings have no place in Islam. Kings with absolute power have no place anywhere in the world. They're an affront to democracy. But King Abdullah is not, in my opinion, himself personally, a bad person. And I hope that he will listen to this appeal, to these appeals, to save the life of Sheikh al nimr Because to execute him unjustly would not just be a sin, would not just be a crime but would be a blunder, a real, real blunder. God willing, next week. Hello, please comment your name and number. And just make sure that your telephone is 0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-